welcome to this session of the York Festival of Ideas. My name is Dr. Jane Raish. I'm a lecturer in the Department of English and Related Literatures here at the University of York. It is my pleasure to be the chair of this session, which is in partnership with the City College University of York Europe camp campus based in Thessaloniki, Greece. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Paul Cartledge, A.G. Leventis Senior Research Fellow of Clare College, University of Cambridge, UK, and Emeritus A.G. Leventis Professor of Greek Culture in the Faculty of Classics. He is the author, co-author, editor, or co-editor of well over a score of books, including the Cambridge Illustrated History of Ancient Greece, The Spartans and Epic History, Alexander the Great, The Hunt for a New Past, Thermopylae, The Battle That Changed the World, and Democracy A Life. He co-edits a monograph series, sits on the editorial board of many learned journals, and serves as a consultant in ancient history to publishers on both sides of the Atlantic. Today, we are delighted to welcome Paul to talk about his new book, Thebes, The Forgotten City of Greece, in which he brings this city vividly to life. So I would love to hand it over now to Paul to hear more about his fascinating work. Thank you. Let me start then with the title, title slides. You may notice that uh, in the title of my talk and the title of my um, slideshow, there is a slight discrepancy. The lecture talk is Forgotten City of Ancient Greece. Up on the screen is Lost City of Ancient Greece. Well, it's been both. Um, Thebes has suffered from a comparison with, and if you like, um, being put in the shade to some degree by three other Greek political entities, ancient Greek. First of all, Sparta, which has been uh, a subject of my research for over 50 years. I did my doctoral study Oxford doctoral dissertation on early Spartan archaeology and history. Athens, well, everybody studies Athens, don't we? And in fact, part of the problem with studying ancient Greek history is Athens tends to obtrude rather too much, such that what we'd like to hear about more generically about ancient Greece gets filtered through or obscured by Athenian sources and Athenocentric uh, ideology. And then the other, the third and uh, in a way greatest of the ancient Greek polities that uh, between them obtruded the history of Thebes is Macedon. Macedon, the kingdom up in North Greece, which came to prominence in particular in the fourth century BC, that's the 300s BC or before the common era BCE, under two successive kings, Philip II, who reigned from the uh, 350s to the mid 330s BC, when he was assassinated. And that tells you a little bit about the nature of the Macedonian state. It was an autocracy tempered by assassination. And he was succeeded by the crown prince, his eldest son, Philip had many wives and more than one son. And this son was Alexander, who through his feats, mainly of conquest in the Middle East, that is of the Persian empire, became known later as the great. In fact, he's one of those two people I know in which the great has been uh, added to his first name. So in modern Greek, he's Megalexandros, in the same way as Charlemagne is Charles the Great uh, of uh, the great Archon-based uh, early European empire. So forgotten is because of Athens, Sparta, Macedon, largely. Lost is what I've put on the screen, because for 20 years, the city of Thebes simply ceased to exist. On the orders of Alexander the Great, and uh, I'll come right at the end back to something about the origins of why this happened. In 335 BC, BCE, Alexander ordered the destruction, physical, the annihilation of the city of Thebes and the enslavement of Thebans 
whom he didn't actually kill. Many thousands were killed. Uh, many thousands more were enslaved and others went into exile. For 20 years, the city of Thebes ceased to exist between 335 and 315. So that's the ancient problem <laughs> with studying Thebes. What I'm uh, engaged in, as you can see, is a kind of act of resurrection. I'm trying to replace Thebes in your minds as a central part of our inheritance from ancient Greece. And on my slideshow, I've said, what have the Thebans ever done for us? Well, I'm going to suggest one or two things that they uh, might have done that you might think were worth doing for us. But there is also a modern complication. Going back, of course, to antiquity, probably all of you have heard of King Tut, King Tut Ankh Amun of uh, Egypt, the new kingdom of Egypt. He's actually a very minor uh, royal and did very little. But 100 years ago, in 1922, his tomb was uh, discovered and excavated by Howard Carter, putting Tut, King Tut, forever, as it were, on the mental map of those of us who think about uh, ancient Egypt. Unfortunately for me um, and for the ancient Greek Thebans, the ancient Greeks called the place where Tut was buried Thebes. In, in Greek language, that is the name of the part of Egypt where King Tut's burial is. And so when you go to Egypt today, you'll probably be told, yes, you're going to Luxor. That's the modern name. But within Luxor is the burial ground of the, the pharaohs in ancient Thebes. Well, so this is not the Thebes I'm talking about. Forget about uh, ancient Egyptian Thebes, though, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to completely because as we'll see, there is one very def definite connection between ancient Greek and ancient uh, e Egypt and therefore ancient Egyptian themes. So enough about my title. Let me set the scene geographically, first of all, by showing you what we call Aegean or Old Greece. Actually, Greeks lived by about 500 BC, all around the Mediterranean, all around the Black Sea to the northeast. And Plato, in one of his dialogues, 4th century BC, Athenian philosopher, rather wittily said, we Greeks live around a pond like ants or frogs. So the frog is the uh, Mediterranean, sorry, the frogs are the Greeks living on the banks of the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And there were about a thousand separate Greek political entities. So the fact that Thebes was one of the top four, shall we say, in the premiership, and at some points, uh, I'll come to one of them, actually numero uno, number one in terms of power and influence, is very striking. We're not dealing here, in other words, with just any old Greek city, but one of the uh, really big ones. The Aegean area here, uh, has on either side of it what's now Turkey and what's now Greece, something like 700 entities. And one of the most important and threatening events in the whole of ancient Greek history is one that some of us are commemorating, celebrating uh, this year because it's the 2500th anniversary of a particular battle fought within the same region as, as Thebes and which was a victory for the relatively few Greeks brave enough, determined enough to resist a massive Persian invasion from uh, the east. And this is the Battle of Plataea, 479 BC. However, and this is another reason why ancient Greek Thebes has a particular problem struggling for unqualified memory. In other words, we look back and do we think with unclouded vision that Thebes was altogether wonderful? Well, sadly, no, it was not. Of course, very few states ever are. But in 479, 
Thebes was on what we would say the wrong side. All of Northern Greece and Central Greece down to Boeotia had gone over to or been conquered by the invading Persians. In a way, therefore, Thebes had no choice. It would have been extremely brave to have stood out against the weight of Persian invasion in the way that Athens, further to the south and protected by its navy, whereas Thebes is a land power, and Sparta, another land power, but even further south and protected by geography as well as by politics, they could in a way more easily afford to resist, in a way the Thebans couldn't. Let me move on. This is to show you now on the right an old map, on the left just a very sketchy regional map to indicate to you where ancient Boeotia, Viotia in modern Greek, lies. And it's uh, Thebes is to the south uh, east of this region. And you'll see there on Boeotia a very large expanse of blue to the north central part of Boeotia. That is Lake Kopais, famous in antiquity for its eels. I live in Cambridge, which is about 15 miles from Ely, and Ely gets its name also from eels. At any rate, that lake has now been drained and so if you go to Boeotia today you'll find a topography that is completely alien to antiquity because what Lake Copais did was divide the whole region of Boeotia. United by dialect, they all spoke the Boeotian dialect of uh, Greek, United by religion, they worship the same gods in the same way, in the same selection of gods, goddesses, heroes and heroines. Divided in antiquity, north-south, between major city in the southeast, Thebes always, major city in the northwest, or Homonus. So if you bear in mind, territory of Boeotia is the frame within which Thebes history should always be viewed, Thebes lies about 90 kilometers or 55 miles to the northwest of Athens, and I shall move on from there. So this is another map of Greece, but this now is not just a topographical or geographical, it is a chronological map, and the key adjective there is Mycenaean. Mycenae you'll see down in the Peloponnese, underlined in the northeast. It's what we call the type site of late Bronze Age Greece, between circa 1500 and circa 12 or 1100, some three to four centuries in the late second millennium BC. Mycenae pitches up, of course, famously, most famously in terms of ancient literary sources in the epic of Homer, because the king of Mycenae was Agamemnon, and Agamemnon had a brother called Menelaus, who was married to Helen, a princess of uh, Sparta, and Menelaus's Helen was a bad girl, and she either willingly or unwillingly um, left Sparta. <laughs> to go and spend time with Priam, Prince of Troy. Troy is on the Hellespont, you'll see up to the north uh, and east, uh, on, not on this map, but on other maps. And that caused what we call the Trojan War, part of which, that is part of the last 10th year of which, is the subject of Homer's Iliad. It takes its name from the site of Troy, which in ancient Greek was both Troia and Elion. So Elias is a poem about the city of Elion or Troy, but notoriously, famously, brilliantly, it does not end with the capture of Troy and the destruction of Troy and the liberation of Helen. It ends way before that with the death of Hector and the lamentation of his father, King Priam of Troy, his astonishing reconciliation with his son's killer, Achilles, and 
the thought, and it's not a good thought uh, from our point of view at any rate, that soon enough Trojan women, particular ones, of course, famous ones, royal ones, will soon be the in practice slaves of conquering Greeks who will take them back to mainland Greece to be there. Well, because they're often married already, we would say now, I suppose, their mistress or their concubine. So this is the literary background to what we call Mycenaean Greece. We date the Trojan War to probably the 13th century BC, BCE. If it ever happened, by which I mean, if it happened in the way Homer and the other poets describe it, a 10 year siege, when it's only just a few days sail from the bit of Greece we're looking at today, I don't think so. At any rate, there could have been a major siege. It certainly wouldn't have lasted 10 years. It might have been about the capture of a very important Greek woman. That's not beyond the range of possibility, but it could also have been much more sordidly a matter of power and economics than of sexual politics. So I've mentioned Mycenae. If you move your eye up to what we looked at in the last slide to Boeotia, you'll come to Thebes, you'll see that underlined, and you'll see Orchomenos underlined. The third site, which is now um, in the midst of a barren uh, field, um, but was then on the banks of the Lake Copais, is Gala, GLA. Absolutely extraordinary site, massive pillars of fortification. Probably the city was used as some sort of marshalling area or gathering ground for Boeotian forces, as opposed to being an independent um, royal power in its own right, as Thebes and Orchomenos were. So uh, we come to look at the sort of evidence we have from the site of Mycenaean Late Bronze Age Thebes. And it's of two kinds, of course, archaeological, meaning non-linguistic, non-written, mute um, cultural uh, material evidence. And on the other hand, uh, uh, on the other hand, as we have here, an example of the sort of script and the sort of material that the um, Mycenaean Theban scribes of the palace of Thebes used to write their bureaucratic reckoning of all the products, natural products, whether grain or in this case wool, that were coming into the palace. It was requisitioned because this is a centralized distributive economy and then out from the palace in other forms in other ways. And so this particular scribe wrote about grain and wool on the same a tablet, which is quite interesting. Most of them tend to be either the one uh, or the other. Now, what that tells us is that there was writing in ancient Greece. The Greeks had learned to write Greek, and the Linear B script was brilliantly, famously uh, deciphered in 1952 exactly 70 years ago this year by an architect actually called Michael Ventris, V-E-N-T-R-I-S. And it told us two things. First, that the Greeks were literate, yes, but that they wrote their Greek in a syllabary, that is a consonant plus vowel, not in an alphabetic script. And in a way, this was a full start because this type of uh, literacy is called special literacy. It's not general literacy. Ordinary Mycenaean Thebans or people within the orbit of the palace would not have known how to write in this script and they would not have needed to write in this script. And so it's going to take a, a long time and a completely new set of circumstances for the Greeks to reinvent a script, a Greek script, uh, an alphabetic script, borrowing from their Near Eastern neighbours in what we call Phoenicia, modern, modern Lebanon. Let me move on. 
that tablet and this item on your screen were both found on the name that the historical Thebans gave to their Acropolis, which is a huge mound, much longer than the Athenian Acropolis, but not as tall. On the other hand, much bigger than, for example, the Spartan Acropolis. Now, Sparta has an Acropolis, but it's not particularly acro, which means high. Acropolis means high city. So why did the Thebans call their Acropolis, their central place where the Mycenaean palace was, where in historical times all the governmental buildings were, where the major religious shrines were, the Cadmire? Because they believed, it's I think unique, I may be wrong about this, that their founder, the person who, now we're talking about myth as opposed to history, was called uh, Cadmos, and they believed that he came from that very same part of the ancient world I've mentioned, Phoenicia, which is Lebanon, that he came to what came to be called Europe, Evropi, because he was chasing his sister, who was called Evropi. It's one of the ironies of history that Europe is named after an Asiatic princess. At any rate, why was um, Cadmos chasing after Evropi? Because she had been stolen, i.e. well abducted, and some would go further and call it raped, by Zeus, but not Zeus in human form. The, the ancient Greeks conceived their gods as humans, but in much bigger, more powerful form, whether male or female. But Zeus had this capacity of metamorphosis. He transformed himself into a bull. And it was on the back of a bull that uh, um, Europe was uh, removed from Asia, and initially to Crete, later to uh, mainland Greece. At any rate, Cadmos chased after her, and then by a whole series of accidents, fetched up in what we call Boeotia and led by an oracle from the uh, Delphic oracle of Apollo. All this is, of course, extremely dubious because whenever Cadmos might have done what he was doing, there wasn't probably an oracle functioning at Delphi in the way that it functioned in historical time. This is anachronism. At any rate, he founds the city of Thebes and he builds it up with the help, some divine help, into a huge city with great big walls with seven gates and so that is historical Thebes, a major city, terrific city centre, the Cadmire, big walls, seven entrance and exit gates. So to look at the screen specifically you see here an ivory pixis which is a toilette box usually owned by females to contain their uh, cosmetics within. And it shows you two confronted uh, sphinxes. Now, sphinx, you might immediately think uh, Egypt. Well, of course, the famous sphinx with the pharaoh's head uh, in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. However, in the translation or borrowing of this motif by Greeks from Egyptians, they affected a different kind of transformation, a transgendering. Egyptian sphinxes are male, Greek sphinxes are female. Now, I'm coming back to this because it exemplifies one particular aspect of the way in which Greeks, ancient Greeks, and I mean ancient Greek males, thought of ancient Greek females with a certain amount of, shall we say, fear, certainly caution, because sphinxes, like many other, and I'm using the word deliberately, monsters, were all considered to be of the female gender by the ancient Greeks. They did very nasty things. Let me just mention the harpies that Odysseus had to contend with in the other Homeric epic. So here we have Ivory, which of course is not native to Greece, that has to be imported, elephant ivory probably, and it's made though by a Greek craftsman working for a palatial um, um, patron within the palace system of uh, Mycenaean, that is late Mycenaean um, uh, Greece, 
in Thebes. So now I'm going to jump over quite quickly. I'm going to move more quickly because I want to get to, um, if you like, one of the high spots of the ancient Thebans history. But we've moved from prehistory to proto-history or early history from the 13th century BC to the 8th century BC to an artifact not this time made in Thebes, actually made in Athens, but somehow acquired by a Theban whose family rated this um, object, which is a um, mixing bowl, a kratia, so highly as to put it in the occupant, presumably female, uh, sorry, presumably male, uh, his grave in the later part of the 8th century BC. And it shows very clearly, you can see a ship and a warship because it's a, an oared ship. And it has two superimposed banks in this mode of depiction, probably depicting side by side oarsmen rather than two banks of oars. But what I want you to look at is the scene on the left. There is a male and there is a female. And the male has grasped the female's arm or just below the wrist at any rate quite firmly. And it looks as if he is somehow taking her on board. That, that seems to be the most obvious interpretation. And most people give this not a, as it were, genre, that is not a natural explanation, but they see this as a mythical scene, one actually of the very earliest scenes of myth on um, Greek artifacts. And so who then are the two figures? Well, there are at least a couple of possibilities. One is Menelaus taking uh, Helen on board. But this is made in Athens, and so I think a more likely explanation is that it is Theseus who has rescued the Cretan princess Ariadne. Theseus was, as it were, the Bronze Age hero of the Athenians. He was the guy, if you were to think, who was the greatest of the earliest um, Athenians, Theseus would come to your mind immediately for his great exports in killing monsters in this sense of both um, animal monsters and indeed uh, human monsters, Procrustes and so on. And so that's possibly the immediate inspiration. And I cite it partly because it indicates whoever got hold of this pot was interested in mythography. Myth means a traditional tale. And Myths are sometimes just entertaining, but quite often they contain messages. They are ways of talking about things that are of general significance in elevated, othering sorts of ways. And it's very striking that the Thebans were amongst the most creative and inventive of all ancient Greeks in the way of inventing stories, myths, which didn't just apply to or were not just interesting to Thebans, but quickly became universalized, taken over by other Greeks in other cities. However, and I'm going to come on to this, though Theban poets between them composed some four epics, I mean, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, really important, but about Theban early history or what they took to be history, none of them has survived, whereas the Homeric epics uh, have survived. So we'll leave that thought with you. Now, I mentioned religion a couple of times. A lot of our evidence, archaeological and indeed literary and epigraphical, that is, as in this case, written text, in this case a text inscribed on a bronze figurine. Many of that type of evidence um, refers to religion, what we call religion, the things of the gods, the ancients called it. And so you have here an example of a Theban called Manticlos, and he has done something which, um, or he's about to do something, which demands a classically Greek attitude to the gods. If I can put it this way, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You do me a good turn, 
in this case, Apollo, I'll do you a good turn in return. And if you think about it, where would the gods have been without the ancient Greek worshippers of them? I mean, I'm not being entirely frivolous. Of course, they're in some sense invented and shaped and imagined by humans. But in the ancient Greek sense, this has a very strong connection because, as I say, they formulated, they theorized, they imagined their gods and goddesses as if they were of human shape basically speaking. In this case, Apollo. So this may well be thought to be, in other words, Manticos imagined what he was dedicating was not an image of himself, but an image of Apollo. And Apollo was one of the two major gods of ancient Thebes, the other one being Dionysus, Apollo and Dionysus. He's the bearer of the silver bow, he's the archer goddess, and this is dedicated therefore to the far shooter. And it's very brilliantly, uh, if you can imagine the genitals of the figurine in amongst the writing, you can see how the writing has gone up and down each thigh and round and across um, the genitals in the middle. Very handsome, totally geometric, uh, the triangular face, the triangular torso, etc., etc. Now, another thing that the Thebans were particularly noted for in their time, early Thebans, and I'm going on about this because their Athenian neighbors liked to present the Thebans as Philistines, interested only in the things of their belly, not the things of their mind, another type of artifact for which the Thebans were particularly noted, that is they both created them and they dedicated them, they commissioned them, were these full-size, uh, kouros is the technical term, kouros means a young boy, a uh, sub-adult, adolescent if you like, and you can see no beard, so not yet grown the beard of manhood, and uh, sort of fresh-faced and young, totally naked, about a hundred of these have been found in various forms of preservation at this one shrine. And I said there are several shrines of Apollo throughout Boeotia. This is from the Petoion, uh, and it's now in uh, the museum in Thebes. We're talking about the 6th century BC, the 500s, and more particularly the second half of the 500s. Now, I've mentioned already, and I was really... Um, bringing this up uh, in order to present to you the fact that Thebans were particularly fertile in inventing mythical stories about their early past, Cadmos down. The royal family of Thebes has a complicated and you might say horrendous um, history and there is none more unfortunate, though she herself was I think quite heroic uh, than Antigone or Antigone, as she's pronounced in uh, modern Greek. And Antigone's name could mean anti against goni reproduction because she never married, she committed suicide, and therefore she never had children. And so here is a very sad tale of kings and. Uh, princesses. Creon, in this particular uh, picture, of a uh, painter uh, called the Dolon painter, and this pot belongs to the early 4th century BC, the early 300s. Creon is her uncle, her mother's brother, and he has succeeded to her father, who is not only her father, but also her half-brother. Oedipus. I'm sure you all know the story. Oedipus's parents get an oracle from Delphi. Your son will kill ye his father and will marry his mother. Oh my goodness, no. When he's a baby, he's transported, taken away to uh, Corinth on the Isthmus of Corinth, where he grows up imagining him to be Corinthian the son of the king and queen of Corinth. For some reason, he decides to take a journey north and at a crossroads in central Greece, he encounters an old man and his retinue. That old man 
without uh, Oedipus knowing is his father. Oedipus is naturally very irascible. He kills his father and all his entourage. He moves on north to Thebes, where he finds Thebes suffering a terrible plague, which has been inflicted on them by a horrendous monster, the Sphinx, a female Sphinx. And the only way in which the plague of Thebes can be uh, got rid of is by somebody solving a riddle. And there are various versions of the riddle of the Sphinx, but at any rate, Oedipus answers one of them. Thebes is rid of the plague. Uh, Oedipus arrives in a Thebes, which is in mourning because their king has just been murdered. But there's a vacancy for the throne and the widow of the last king, Yocasti or Epicasti, she's variously named, is willing to take on the much younger, at least I would say 15 to 20 years younger Oedipus. We're in an Emmanuel Macron and Brigitte Macron situation here as her husband and with him she begets four children of whom one is Antigone and Antigone falls out to put it mildly with Creon who succeeds Oedipus. There's a terrible um, battle between two other brothers of hers. One kills the other in a civil war and so Creon becomes uh, tyrant really, uh, king of Thebes. All that is brilliantly described, discussed, presented in Sophocles, of course, his play eponymous Antigone, about 440 BC, about half a century before this pot was painted. Just to show you quickly another Athenian artifact, absolutely brilliant 3D representation of a very obviously female sphinx. I won't go on about um, the details any further than that, except to say, because it's whole, that tells you it's from a tomb, and it's actually found in southern Italy. Many best Athenian pots were exported to Greek and non-Greek patrons in southern Italy, from the Bay of Naples uh, southwards. Another example of um, a scene from um, another play, an Athenian play, on a Theban myth, and we're now talking about a descendant of uh, Cadmos, we're talking about Pentheus, who, as this scene graphically depicts, was ripped apart by his mother, Agave, and her sister, Eno, because they thought in their stupor, their madness, they'd been uh, intoxicated by the new, as represented God, Dionysus. Dionysus coming to assume his major role as one of the two principal deities of Thebes. He intoxicates the women of Thebes, especially the upper class women, including the royal women. And so Pentheus is torn apart. And the Athenians took, I think, considerable delight in representing these um, uh, Theban myths on the Athenian stage and on Athenian pottery, because it <clears throat> made the Thebans, who were their enemies very often, look very bad. The play in question here is, of course, by Euripides. It is the Bacchae, or the Menads, the mad women, of the very end of the 5th century BC, 406, 405 BC. And just to conclude the theatrical element before we go on to the Thebes, the city of history, for the last five to ten minutes, this is the so-called pronomos vase. Yes, it's Athenian. You can see the date. It's circa 400 BC. But Pronomos, the guy in the middle at the bottom with a double aulos, A-U-L-O-S, we say flute, but it's really more like a, a, an oboe because it's a reeded instrument. Pronomos was the best. He was the uh, James Galway of his era in ancient Greece, the best flautist or if you like, oboist, and he was in this case hired to accompany what looks like 
a satyr drama, a cast of satyr drama. So in Athens, there are two types of um, presentation, two types of theatrical performances and um, compositions. So poet playwrights either wrote tragedies with an added satyr drama, or they wrote comedies. They didn't seem to write both. Satyr drama is added on to the three tragedies, and it has a comic element. And so here we see in all their finery, including Dionysus, and you'll remember Ariadne I mentioned, that Theseus uh, rescued from uh, Crete, though he, I'm sorry to say, left her on Naxos, where uh, Dionysus rescued her later on, the island of Naxos. So this is an absolutely magnificent pot celebrating a victory in the competition at Athens. Now let's get down to some really heavy duty stuff. I mentioned right in my introduction, the Greco-Persian Wars. And well, willy nilly, the Thebans were on the wrong side in those. After the Greco-Persian Wars of between about 500 and 479, the Greek world, the mainland Greek world split into two major opposing camps, one led by uh, Sparta, one led by Athens. Thebes, in between the two, Sparta and Athens, did have a choice. Did it join Athens against Sparta, or did it join Sparta against uh, Athens? And it decided on the latter. It joined Sparta. One major reason for that was that it was of an oligarchic type of um, government. A few wealthy Thebans controlled the city of Thebes. A few wealthy Thebans indeed controlled most of the cities of Boeotia. And Thebes was the leader of the Boeotians. There was a kind of organization, some of us would call it federal or proto-federal. Quite interesting, common institutions, common council, common treasury, common military arrangements. Well. In 431, the simmering tensions between the two big power blocks led by Sparta and Athens boiled over. And they boiled over, interestingly, in Boeotia, at the site of Plataea, 431, what we call the Peloponnesian War breaks out. And I'm just illustrating a simple uh, example of an image. It's grave steely, it's from Tanagra, and uh, Tanagra was a, a battle site more than once in Boeotia, and it was where this man, Salgenes, a man of Tanagra, was killed, presumably fighting on the Theban, that is Spartan side, against the Athenians in the late 5th century BC. You can't see very clearly, but right up in the pediment, there is a scene depicted of a symposium. So the Greeks liked to think that their afterlife was a sort of version of life up on earth, though it was down below, uh, only they hoped even better in that it would be constant feasting and what have you. That's the hope of Salgonese's relatives when they set up that. Now, moving on, and this is really the, um, the, the pinnacle, the summit, why should we think back to ancient Thebes as anything more? Well, I, I've already given you quite a lot. Um, the fount and origin of lots of wonderfully uh, impressive and influential myths, but why should we think of it as a city in history of real political heft with anything to tell us still today? And if I were to give you that in one word, it would be my history hero, that is my ancient Greek history hero, a man called Epaminondas. It's a bit of a mouthful, but he was a Theban. He was born in the late fifth century BC. He rose to be not just the greatest general of Theban allied armies, but also a political thinker and strategist of great foresight and I would say humanity, because he was a convinced 
federalist as opposed to imperialist. That is, he thought Thebes' influence and power should be expanded not by direct conquest and direct rule or by colonization, sending out Thebans to occupy places elsewhere in Greece, but through alliance on an equal basis and within Thebes and Boeotia, federalism, outside Thebes and Boeotia, the encouragement of new federal states. So between 371 and 362 BC, as you see on the screen, having defeated the Spartans, and in fact, put an end to them as a great power for good in 371, at a battle within Boeotia at Leuctra, Epaminondas then led Thebes after that great battle in Boeotia, led Thebes and allies into the Peloponnese, liberating large numbers of Greeks who had been, well, what should we say, suppressed by the Spartans. I'm talking about the Greeks who were within the Spartan state, they were Greek, they worshipped the same gods, they spoke the same dialect of Greek, etc. But they were in effect slaves, and we call them the helots. They call them high loti, which means captives. And so, Epaminondas not only liberated thousands of them, but he made sure they were not going to be re-enslaved by supporting the foundation of a new city, Messini. And uh, Epaminondas never married. And I think that's probably because he's what we would call today gay. Many Thebans were bisexual, but Epaminondas seems to have been monosexual and predominantly, if not exclusively, homosexual. Uh, he founded Messini and he later founded Megalopolis, and he called those two cities his daughters. Uh, and so, what a great uh, sort of legacy to have left, not a family, but two cities. So that's just to show you the sorts of instruments. This is in a uh, case of a coin from one of the cities of the Federation of Boeotia, dominated by Thebes. But I'm going to concentrate, I'm back going to end on this um, monument. It's at Chironia, which is in Boeotia, central Boeotia, a famous battleground, two or three major battles were fought here. But the battle that interests us now was fought in 338 BC. For complicated reasons, in the fourth century, Thebes, having shoveled off its allegiance to uh, Sparta, having become a kind of democracy, moved towards Athens. And as Macedon rose up in the north under Philip II, so Thebes and Athens, two democracies, came closer and closer together to such an extent that in 340-339, they made an alliance engineered by the famous Athenian Demosthenes against Philip. Philip took that as an act of provocation leading to war. He duly invaded and in 338 won a huge battle against the conjoined forces of Thebes and Athens. After the battle, probably some time after the battle, this monument was set up on the battlefield by the Thebans. Why? Why would they want to mark a defeat? Well, it's thought to be very near the tomb of a particular unit of the Theban army, known as the Sacred Band. 150 gay, we would say, homosexual, adult couples. How it was recruited, how it was maintained, etc., problematic. What we do know is that it was led by premier generals of the Thebans, that it played key roles in the victory at Leuctra that I mentioned, and sadly in the defeat at Chironia, where every member of the band died, all 300. And I think this, when the city of Thebes was resurrected after having been physically annihilated on Alexander's orders, when it was resurrected, the Thebans wanted to look back to the glories of their old past. And this is one of them. So if you have been, thank you very much for listening.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. That was an absolutely stimulating and incredibly fascinating talk. And I think the testament to that is in the many questions we have in the Q&A, which unfortunately we won't be able to get to all of them today, um, but they're all wonderful questions. A handful of them I think you've already answered, but perhaps we can start with one that um, actually a couple of our audience members have asked about. And this this is really um, two questions about particularly linear B and the way in which it was written, particularly in the slide you were showing us, on such small sort of tablets. And the question is sort of how difficult would it have been for scribes to navigate um, writing linear B in some, such small surfaces? Um, yeah. Someone's also asking about, you know, how did eyesight <laughs> uh, work with, with, with navigating this? So if you could maybe speak a little bit more about what we know about um, the writing of linear B and particularly the kind of size of, of the tablets, that would be great. No, that's great. They are just a few centimeters long. That's absolutely right. And of course, when they were written on, the clay was wet. Why do they survive? Because the palace was burned sometime in the second half of the 13th century. This is part of a much bigger picture. Mycenae was burned, Pylos, another was burned, Sparta was burned. Something's going on. Either there's a force coming in from outside, which is attacking all of those, or individually there are as it were uprising civil wars going on within these kingdoms at any rate something happened which put an end to the entire palace kingdom era of greek civilization so you've got these very small you're quite wrong typically long elongated tapering at either end because they have to be carefully placed one upon another and then stored in the storeroom and they are though year by year um, reports so they're not in other words for all time the reason they survive is as i say accidentally because they were burned and beyond a certain temperature clay when it's fired is indestructible unless you grind it down how physically did they <laughs> acquire the skills and um, the dexterity and, of course, the eyesight? Well, I mean, I can't say any more than I'm amazed, too. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. Um, and I, I think we have time for at least one more question. Um, and there's a question from a guest here that is asking a little bit to hear a little bit more about that wonderful late geometric crater that you were uh, describing as, as perhaps representing Theseus. And to just say a little bit more about whether there's other evidence around uh, the, the, the sort of depiction on, on that vase and to just hear a little bit more about that particular object. Right, that's a very lovely question. And um, the eighth century BC was when, as I said, the Greeks rediscovered an alphabet, Aleph, and bet in Greek um, mean nothing. Alpha, beta, they're just names. They're the Greek versions of the Semitic words aleph meaning an ox head and bet means a house. So in other words, some Greek or Greeks came across alphabetic writing which had been going on for hundreds of years in the Middle East, in the Levant, and thought gosh, it would be nice to be able to write again. And this system seems quite simple because as we know, a child of two or three can learn an alphabet, 24, 25, 26, 28 symbols, as against linear B, 200 signs and symbols. So for whatever reason, writing was actually rediscovered, probably commercial. It was very quickly applied to what you and I would call literary matters. So writing down stories. And some people think that the Homeric epics were some of the first things to be written down. I actually think probably not, because that would have taken so long and be so complicated. It would have to be on papyrus rolls imported from Egypt. Very expensive, take a long time. I think that didn't come until later. But... We have lots and lots of little messages and little messages containing names. What we don't have in the 8th century is on such images any text which says this is Theseus, this is Ariadne. Now, some of your uh, read, some of your listeners, sorry, your hearers, um, may know of a vase which was excavated in Etruria. It's an Athenian, and it's called the Francois vase. It is absolutely covered the, the surface with names. 
In other words, each character in the myth, myths and its Trojan War, of course, gets their name. So it's purely a guess. If you're dealing with a, uh, an image such as on that crater, you think it's not real life. You think it's probably more likely to be myth, because why would anybody want to do a real life scene. I mean, it's not impossible. A painter might have said, I've seen those guys rowing a boat like that, and I want to see what I can do on a two dimensional surface. It's possible. But I think if you want to enhance the value of your pot, you get more money for it if the purchaser, he might have actually specified what scene he wants depicted. But if at any rate, you give the viewer the idea that this could be a very interesting, and then of course it allows the viewer to, as it were, write the story that they want. So I hope that's helpful. That's lovely. And um, again, I think we could talk for another 30 minutes, unfortunately. <laughs> um, we, need to, we need to end here, however. Uh, and I'm sure everyone on the, the call today uh, will want to join me virtually in thanking Paul so very, very much for such, again, a stimulating talk talk today. Um, thank you very much for being here with us. Um, if you would like to purchase a copy of Paul's book, which I have to say I highly recommend, <laughs> um, you can uh, do that uh, from the partner bookseller for the Festival of Ideas, that's Fox Lane Books. You'll find more information uh, on the website for the Festival of Ideas. And we hope that many of you will join us for many other different events and sessions as part of the Festival of Ideas. It's an incredibly rich and wonderful event 